So often people are so critical about their bodies, particularly at midwife, or, you know, all, you know, my boobs are sagging or my stomach's coming out or my skin's not as good as it was. This body has carried you through life and all of its experiences for this many years. Just get up every day and go, thank you, thank you, body. Cue music. Places, everybody places. We're starting in three, two. Welcome to the Autoimmune Hour, where we look at the rise of autoimmune disorders. I've brought together top experts that range from doctors, specialists, nutritionists, researchers, and even those recovering from autoimmune to bring you the latest, most up-to-date information about autoimmunity and how to live your life uninterrupted. Thank you for joining us here on the Autoimmune Hour with Sharon Saylor. Always seek sound legal, medical, and or professional advice regarding any problems, conditions, and any of the recommendations you see, hear, or read here on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio. Now, we don't want you to worry about taking too many notes, so you can join the Autoimmune Hours Courage Club, and we'll send you the transcripts and show notes from every episode. Sign up now at understandingautoimmune.com. Now, back to your host, Sharon Saylor. Welcome, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour. I'm Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com. And as always, it's my honor and privilege to be with you here today. And I'm so excited. We're having a return guest. Her name is Pat Duckworth. She's in the UK. We're doing a pre-record because of the time changes and everything. And she and I just got off a fantastic Facebook Live for her wonderful group, which we'll chat about a little bit, too. And we were having so much fun. We said, let's record a show for the autoimmune hour. So why not, right? (laughs) Run with it. Let me introduce Pat so you guys can get a flavor for her. She's awesome. She is an international best-selling author, therapist, and public speaker, world-known public speaker. She specializes in helping women through the midlife, particularly those experiencing menopause symptoms. And she, one of the courses she teaches uh, we'll ask her about how it works in the pandemic, though. It's about you know workplace and the menopause w- and menopause, which to me I was like, wow, that's great. And she's a passionate, passionate person about inspiring us to be the best we can be at any age of our lives. So I just thought we just have a free forming, uh, running good time, Pat. So welcome. <laughs> There's always something to talk about, Sharon. There's never any shortage of stuff to talk about. <laughs> Absolutely, for sure. So I wanted to chat with you a little bit. First off, let's talk about, I think one of the things we did a whole show on, but you know, that was a while ago. I wanted to talk about this idea of the difference between menopause and autoimmune. And I related my experience to you a few years ago, how I was having trouble sleeping, night sweats, and never, I think I had one hot flash my whole time. I mean, in a way, according to other women and what I see from my friends, I breezed through it. Yet one of the things that was a surprise to me, I'm talking to my rheumatologist about these new symptoms, these new things. And, you know, I th- I'm thinking autoimmune, like, oh, my gosh, is it a flare? Is it this or that? And she wisely goes, hmm, it could be menopause. <laughs> so <laughs> let's talk about a little bit of the differences that you've seen and how those two can get confused. Yeah, so... Uh... There's so many things I could tell you about. As the reproductive hormones go into reduction, I always have to use my hands. I wish I had my graph, you know. (laughs) So uh, once you get to 25, the reproductive hormones, estrogen, and um, I was going to say phytoestrogen, that's a plant estrogen, (laughs) uh, progesterone start to decline. They don't decline at the same rate. So we go into estrogen dominance. And that's what gives rise to some of the symptoms. But it's not just the reproductive hormones because they knock on to what are called the major hormones. If you're a woman, you think the reproductive hormones are the major hormones. But we're talking about uh, adrenaline and cortisol and thyroid and insulin. And the reduction in the amount of estrogen in the blood has an effect on those hormones as well. And that's why we get such a variety of symptoms and every woman's experience is unique so you know somebody uh, the number of women who say to me I was fine and then others go it was awful because you've got the hot flushes and night sweats that's what everybody thinks it's all about or even like changes in bone density 
But there's a lot more than the physical symptoms. You know, there's the changes in sleep, which you've talked about how the sleep pattern can get disrupted. There's um, perhaps increased levels of anxiety, and that's because of the inter in interaction between the reproductive hormones, the adrenaline and the cortisol. Um, it might be that you start to lose confidence. Again, you know, it's just these hormones in reduction might be that you go into low mood. If you've experienced low mood before you go into menopause, you're more likely to experience it as you're going through menopause. So there's a whole basket of dis different symptoms that you might experience. And it's just unique to you because of the combination of the hormones and the chemicals in your blood, plus how you're eating, plus what you're drinking, plus what your lifestyle is. And so some of these things can get mistaken, particularly, you know, 1% of women go into menopause before they're 40. And if you go into menopause and start getting symptoms before you're 40, then uh, a medical practitioner is more likely to say, well, I don't think it's your menopause. I think you might be having thyroid problems, or I think you might be having anxiety or depression issues because you can go into menopause at any time after you start menstruating I mean you could be in menopause at 18 if you were if that happened but one percent of women just go into menopause earlier with no particular reason it it just happens it's just nature's way so can get pretty confusing and that's why you have to go to your medical practitioner armed with all the facts Oh, absolutely. And is it autoimmune? Is it menopause? Is it something else? <laughs> Do I just need a radical lifestyle change? Yes. Especially now. I mean, right now, I talk to a lot of people who know they have an autoimmune. And yet some of the symptoms they're describing may or may not be autoimmune, as you mentioned here, it could be menopause. And yet they're afraid to go to the doctor. They're afraid to go get the test or, you know, it's just, which adds to the anxiety that we're already feeling. It just seems like right now it's even more difficult to sort out symptoms because how much is situational symptoms? Yeah. I know I mentioned to you about, it's a joke. I mean, it's one of these morbid jokes that only people with autoimmune understand. <laughs> but it's that idea of, I had friends complaining about wearing masks and, and et cetera, et cetera. And I was like, welcome to my world. I've been wearing masks and gloves and hand sanitizer and, you know, uh, six feet social distancing, uh, awakening when I, <laughs> startling when I hear a, a cough. So it's really tough. And I think the situational anxiety has heightened it. So I know you do a lot with hypnotherapy as well. That's one of your expertise. Can we delve into that? Maybe a few of the ways that we can calm ourselves during this heightened it's not just our symptoms anymore. It's sort of everybody seems to be experiencing it. Absolutely. So uh, when I'm working with clients, I'm always trying to give them techniques to use. I, I'm sort of trying to put myself out of a job, really, is give them a toolkit of things that they think, OK, when I experience this, I can do this or I've got I've got choices because knowing you've got choices helps to take away some of that anxiety. A lot of women go into these years around menopause, into their early 40s, middle 40s, late 40s, without ever learning anything about menopause. They don't know what to expect and they don't know then what could be a symptom and what couldn't be. So that's the first tip that I would give you to relieve the anxiety, start learning about it so you know what your options are. I like to teach them relaxation techniques, particularly if women are experiencing problems when they're trying to sleep, because sleep can be one of the first victims of menopause. So really just simple things like a breathing technique, breathing out for longer than you breathe in, just getting into a rhythm of breathing out longer. It acts on your parasympathetic system and it just calms you down. Um, focusing on what you can control and leaving aside what you can't control. We just talked about that at the moment with everything that everybody's going through. Um, I hear clients coming to me and saying, but I go out and there's somebody not wearing a mask in the shop and they're not keeping a two meter distance and this person isn't doing this and this, 
this member of parliament is saying that and do you listen to the news and you go yeah so let's focus on what you can control you can co control what you're eating you can control how you're sleeping you can control how much news you watch you can control your bedroom environment you can control your exercise you can't control all the things that you just told me about let them go stop worrying about them and focus on what you can control and then some visualization um, there's been research into this uh, so the research was done around women who were experiencing hot flushes and poor sleep typical menopause issues because they were being treated with hormones for breast cancer so it's another way in which the menopause symptoms can appear is because you're receiving hormone treatment for another medical issue. And so they did some research around what were good non-invasive ways of helping women having cancer treatment and relaxation coupled with visualization was very powerful. So being able to close your eyes, do the breathing, get yourself a bit more relaxed. And then if you're feeling hot, starting to visualize cool things. Now what they found was most effective was the cool things that you visualize, not ones that somebody gives to you. So I might think that standing outside in the rain would be a lovely cool thing. For somebody else, that's not their thing. They want to see snowflakes going past the window or be standing under a waterfall. Or one of my clients said that her visualization was putting her feet into Wellington boots filled with cold water. <laughs> I would um... not want that visualization. <laughs> But that's what cooled her down. So to cool yourself down, particularly if you're getting hot in bed at night and not in a good way, um, is to think, well, what would be a cool image for you? So do some breathing, picture something that for you would be a comfortably cool thing to picture. Your brain responds to the image and starts to cool you down. Very simple technique. And it's, it was found to be one of the most effective things that women could do. Oh, wow. That's awesome. You know, one of the things that uh, I like, and we've had them on the show, is uh, Loving Meditations, which is a phone app. And uh, like you said, some of them I love and others just don't ring my chimes, but they're, they're always lovely and graphic. But what I love about that one, we've had Dave Dashinger and Tamara Green on who uh, run Loving Meditations. It's nice because you've got the visual there. You can watch it and you can do it anytime. Maybe you're stressed because somebody's <laughs> not wearing a mask and you've just left the shop and you want to calm down for a couple of seconds, just pop in your earbuds and listen to that for a couple of minutes and calm yourself back down. Um, yeah. And I've actually done a cooling visualization for loving meditations uh, to help women who are having hot flushes because of their treatment. So I am on that app. <laughs> oh, fantastic. I didn't know that. I'll have to look you up, Pat. That's awesome. <laughs> it's a great app. You can download it to your phone and use it anytime. It was actually produced for cancer patients, but it, it has been adopted universally for just calming ourselves down. And I love that you said the things you can control because mm. that for autoimmune, how much of that in our body response is pre-pandemic, shall I say. Uh, there were so many things I couldn't control, but knowing what I could control. And we talk here about optimizing just one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. And don't get crazy, you know, like you're not going to fix your menopause all at once. And you're not going to, and I said, don't judge your menopause and don't judge your mm -hmm. autoimmune. Sometimes I breezed through menopause. I really did. But my, I have family members who I watched, I would say suffer. Mm -hmm. So I, I was like, don't, uh, don't judge, leave the judgment at the door on all of this, please. It just seems to be, uh, that seems to be a pandemic to me right now is all the judgment going out there. I'm like, just, just accept ourselves being human, okay? <laughs> and, and just be thankful for your body. I mean, it's got you this far. So often people are so critical about their bodies, particularly at midwife, or, you know, all, you know, my boobs are sagging or my stomach's coming out or my skin's not as good as it was. This body has carried you through life and all of its experiences for this many years. Just get up every day and go, thank you. Thank you, body. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I think gratitude is so underrated as far as the changes that can happen. And I say thank you, body, multiple times a day. 
knowing that even at the height of the autoimmune condition, when it seemed that everything was haywire, I just knew the body was trying to right itself, trying to fix itself. And not only listening to my medical team, but also listening to my body, spending time listening to my body through meditation and mindfulness and just to me, any sort of trance inducing thing, like going for a walk in nature yeah. and listen and then speak it. Oftentimes I would, at first I would be afraid to tell the doctor this or that because it sounded crazy or something like that. Now I just say, this is what's going on for me. Or maybe it's just thoughts because we've talked about situational anxiety and mm. sometimes when whether it's menopause and the hot flashes are so awful. I've had friends who say, you know, it's really embarrassing. The hot flash will happen at the worst time. Yeah. And yet not being able to talk about the elephant in the room in a way is, is to me a little, to me is more harmful than being able just to mention that this is what's going on. Yeah. And, you know, I've, I've known women kind of all ends of that spectrum. I've got one friend who I used to network with and uh, it was majority of men in the room. If she was having a hot flush, she would just go, excuse me a minute, I'm having a hottie, it'll go in a minute. She was not freaked out by it at all. And everybody <laughs> just kind of laughed and accepted it. Other women, they're trying to like, oh, uh, have a drink of water, just don't let anybody look at me. It's a natural thing. And I, I was giving you, you mentioned that I do talks in the workplace and of all things, I was giving a talk at a fire station. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With, you know, uh, and it was a mixed group of uh, male and female firefighters and their back office crew. And um, just saying to them, you know, if this happens, it's just natural. And just think about it as a guy. You know, if you were going to give a presentation and you were a little bit anxious about it because, you know, maybe it was something really important to you and you'd got an item on the agenda and you were about to stand up, you might get hot, you might get a flush, you might start to feel sweaty. It's just what it is, you know, and we all have to, you know, not expect perfection from each other. We're all just human beings having this human experience and what's really important is what's coming from our hearts. Mm, I love that. And my switching, going back a little bit, my little story about what my first hot flash was, I was in a big important meeting, a, a negotiation, doing lots of negotiation. We decided to take a break. They all filed in the elevator together. <laughs> and I'm sort of in the back. And the first thing I noticed is a beads of sweat running down my spine. <laughs> Mm. And I'm going, okay, the back of my blouse is going to be wet. <laughs> I didn't know what it was at first. I was like, am I having a panic attack from the negotiation? Am I having a heart attack? <laughs> Finally, I just grabbed just some cold water and realized, okay, that must be what a hot flash is. And yeah. you had said, you know, we weren't, I wasn't prepared. I did yeah. not know. And so it was a little bit anxiety provoking when I'm like, okay, what is this? then it passed I was, and I was like okay yeah there's a lovely woman in who's in New York called Susie Hadass who went on to create something specifically for women with hot flushes but she said the first time she had one she was talking to a colleague um somebody that she didn't know very well but he was younger than her very good looking and suddenly this hot flush started and so she started doing the kind of hot flush dance you know <laughs> trying to get the hair off the back of her neck and everything he thought she was flirting with him. And so he was kind of, oh, this is quite nice. And, you know, readers, she married him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it can get a bit mis misunderstood. I hadn't thought about the nonverbals of it. That's a really good <laughs> point about the nonverbals of it and what we're doing. <laughs> I hadn't heard the call the hot flash dance either. That's great. We need to take a quick commercial break and a laugh on that image there. <laughs> well, it turned out well. It turned out well for them. So we'll be right back. Life Interrupted Radio will return after these messages from our sponsors. It's great sponsors like these that keep this show coming to you every week. Be sure and stop by LifeInterruptedRadio.com to learn more. Your Conscious Lifestyle on Steroids. 
OM Times Radio, IOM FM. Hello, I'm Lisa Berry. Join me every Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time for Light on Living, a chance to see new, hear different, and feel more as I shine the spotlight on all the ways to lighten the load of life's challenges. Light on Living is your link to that new way you're looking for, that new understanding that will enhance your life, and that positive connection that will support your growth. So join me and you'll gain insight and start to see things in a new way that motivates you. Om Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Om Times co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Listen and imagine. It takes five seconds to send a text, and for those five seconds, you're driving blind. Life is worth more than a text. Stay alive. Don't text and drive. Visit StopTextStopRex.org, a message brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, Project Yellow Light, Noise, and the Ad Council. Hi, this is Sharon, and of course you know me from here on the Autoimmune Hour. Maybe you don't know I'm also an author. My latest book is for kids. It's Pinky Chenille and the Rainbow Hunters, a winner of a five-star reader's favorite review. It's perfect for your early reader and a great bedtime story for your young adventurers. Check it out over at PinkyChenille.com. That's P-I-N-K-Y-C-H-E-N-I-L-L-E dot com. See you there. Welcome back, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour. I'm Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com, and tonight we're here with Pat Duckworth. She's an international best-selling author and public speaker about, I'll say, menopause, as well as other things such as aging gracefully, both for men and women. <laughs> That's a, that topic. But her book is called Hot Women, Cool Solutions. It's a great book about tips and and educating ourselves on what is menopause. It's perfectly natural, as we've been hearing from Pat, and to understand it and be able to differentiate from things. Because as Pat was mentioning, sometimes if you're going through it early, it can be misdiagnosed as other things. And I know it was one thing, some of the other things sometimes misdiagnosed were uh, the interventions can be uh, life-changing. So it's important to be able to go to what I say, the obvious, sometimes the obvious isn't obvious. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, being able to talk to your medical professionals like, oh, well, do you think it could be menopause? Now, what tests would someone ask for if they had that question? Like, okay, I'm starting to notice a few changes that my mother went through or something like that. And So really, it's getting the hormone levels, the levels of estrogen and progesterone checked. And um, that might be a saliva test or it could be a blood test. Uh, The problem is, there's always a problem, isn't there? Uh, (laughs) Or the challenge, let's call it a challenge. The challenge is that whereas if I drew a graph with my hand, it would be a lovely smooth graph of the gentle decline of the hormones. Actually, they don't go like that. They go, "Mm, mm, mm," you know, they spurt and stop, spurt and stop, just as they do when you're having periods. So you might have a hormone test one day and it would appear that you're in the average range for your age of where those hormones are. You might go another day and it's well below average. So uh, getting some tests done over a period of days is much better than just one test to find out whether your hormone levels are dropping or not. So yeah, that's the challenge is making sure you get enough tests to know exactly what situation you're in. Now you mentioned phytoestrogens. Can what I eat fake out those tests? So uh, phytoestrogens, plant estrogens, um, they're a lot more gentle than the hormones that we have naturally in our system. Um, So if you were eating quite a lot of phytoestrogens, then it might appear that your estrogen level is higher than it actually is. So the phytoestrogens are things like, uh, and there are several types of plant estrogen. It's not all one type. 
Uh, but if you were eating a lot of um, more of a, a Japanese diet, so you were having a lot of fermented soya, so miso, tempeh, tofu, they contain a lot of phytoestrogens. Um, if you were eating a lot of chickpeas and hummus and lentils, um, also things like flaxseed, linseed in your diet will all supplement your estrogen levels. So if you know that your estrogen levels are low, they can be good things to eat as a supplement. Uh, they will be a healthy part of your diet. If you're eating a lot of those types of foods, then your estrogen, blood estrogen levels might look higher than they would normally look. Mm, wow. So if I am into those types of foods, or maybe I a chow down on the soy uh, tofu types of products. Should I mention that to my doctor that I do tend to, uh, you know, I eat a lot of tofu or something like that. So it to have that taken into account. Probably if you're eating a lot of those things, you're probably not getting symptoms because um, women in Japan, um, they don't have a term for hot flushes because they just don't get them because of the way their diet is. Uh, if you go, if you mention it to your doctor, you will probably leave him or her completely confused because certainly here in the UK, um, doctors, when they're training, have about four hours of training on nutrition out of five years of training. Yes, that's here in the States as well. I don't know the exact number, but it's minimal on um, understanding nutrition and diet. And even yeah. with autoimmune, when I radically changed my diet, I hired a nutritionist yeah. who actually had an autoimmune condition. And that was the most helpful, one of the most helpful things that I did in my recovery was yeah. hiring someone who understood how food interacts with our body and the things that we can do to supplement its regenerative process. Yeah, really important in menopause is to look at what you're eating. You know, there's this disconnect now between our food and our health. And yet what you're eating and drinking are the building blocks that your body is using to maintain your health. So if you start with looking at what you're eating and keeping a food journal, and we both agree keeping a food journal can be a bit bit boring <laughs> a bit <laughs> very boring <laughs> although in the few times that it's been really helpful to be able to reflect on oh well maybe that could be the problem absolutely because once you start to see the pattern and I've said this to women you know uh, for example red wine red wine can cause hot, hot flushes and they've gone oh oh that's why I tend to have more at the weekend then Absolutely. They've just kind of missed the difference in the patterns of what they're eating and drinking during the week. And then they get confused about why they're having more symptoms at one time or another. Perhaps they drink more coffee during the week because they're at work and they have more hot flushes and feelings of anxiety during the week than they do at the weekend. And they just think, oh, it's because I'm relaxing at the weekend. No, you're not drinking as much coffee. So it's not winding you up as much. Or perhaps at the weekend, you're eating more chocolate and you are getting more hot flushes. And then you might think, do you know what? I don't care. I still want to eat the chocolate. Okay. I, I did not know this. Chocolate can <laughs> cause hot flushes in some people? The caffeine and the sugar. Uh, ah, if you're drinking okay. milk, chocolate. That's my excuse for eating dark chocolate. Dark chocolate, good for you. Milk chocolate, not so good for you. In fact, you know, the dark chocolate can cause the hot flushes as well. But things like red meat, you know, if you're having your roast dinner on a Sunday and then you notice that you have find it harder to sleep that night, could well be the red meat that you're eating. But just noticing the patterns is just so important. It is. It is. And not when I was going through the autoimmune condition, one of the things that we did was what they called an elimination diet. So you mm. eliminate everything basically and, and you start adding back. But I found at a certain point, it became that like, okay, if I add this back and then I would eat it for a week to see what would happen, then I'd eat it for a week to see what would happen. You have to be careful that you don't get stuck there and only eat 12 things for the rest of your life. I think a lot of people go, okay, I feel good here. I'm just going to eat these handful of things and leave it at that and not see what else nutrition can I add back? Because yeah. oftentimes food sensitivities, if you're eating just a handful of things can create 
another problem because you're not getting enough variety in your nutrition. There's certain kind of prime suspects in food, aren't there? You know, we talked um, earlier about the nightshade family, the tomatoes and the peppers and the aubergines and the potatoes. And um, taking those out of your diet, you might see an almost immediate effect of your system calming down. But then trying to live without those things is really <laughs> tough. <laughs> exactly. So adding one a bit, a bit at, at a time. And one of the things about especially tomatoes, I love pasta sauce, you know, but I found right now, even in my, this level of my improvement in my health, I can have pasta sauce once a week. But if I eat two or three, four times of pasta sauce, then I start having some less than desirable symptoms of sensitivities to it. And so just the food journal helped me come to the pattern of, okay, I can have, I can enjoy a, a lovely pasta sauce or something else with a tomato, like a salsa or something once a week. So I can get that craving and then, and still keep my, my balance in my nutrition and my health. And that, I, the other part is to, uh, I think it's really easy to start feeling super great. You get to this point where you start feeling super great and then you start to cheat. Like you go out with your friends and like, oh, I'm feeling so good. I could just have that one piece of gluten cake, you know, whatever. And then the next thing you know, you're, you're down that path of, <laughs> of wanting it all the time. <laughs> Sometimes I do aversion therapy with my clients, you know, making an association between something that they want to stop eating and something really horrible so that in the end they don't really want the thing because all they can think about is the horrible thing. I hate doing aversion therapy before I have my lunch. Because <laughs> <laughs> I have to get really graphic with them because, I, you know, I'm really trying to make it like the most horrible thing. And then I come down to lunch and say to my husband, I don't think I fancy anything today. <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. I hadn't thought of that. Oh, it's so true. And that with autoimmune, and I know with menopause, it's with everything, because it's how your body works and the nutrition you need. A varied diet, variety in your diet is really important. But oftentimes you won't notice the sensitivities right away. I had a friend who I noticed in myself, and I pointed it out to them when I saw them, they, they ate a meal with a wide variety of things. And right after their nose started running, they were sniffling, where they weren't sniffling before. Something in there was a sensitivity. So we wrote it all down so she could start to take apart what is it that causes my nose to run. Yeah, I was flying to America a couple of years ago. I was flying to California and uh, for one of our our meetups, our EBC meetups, and um, I was sitting in a row of three seats and the woman next to the window was from California and she was a yoga teacher. And for the minute she sat down, we were chat, 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 chat. And um, they served a meal just before we were gonna get off the plane. You know, one of those horrible sandwich things. <laughs> and she ate it and immediately she couldn't stop sneezing and her nose was running. and she was really in a mess and she'd been fine. And I said to her, you've, you've come up with a reaction to something. What was it in what you ate? And I said, I have got some antihistamine if you need it or, or you can have a tissue or whatever. But yeah, she had an almost immediate reaction from eating whatever this thing was on the plane. And it, it wasn't even good enough that you'd want to eat it in the first place. <laughs> well, and the problem with a lot of those processed foods is that you don't know uh, it could it may not be the actual sandwich that maybe they put something to preserve it or something yeah. to keep it from turning brown or, or who knows what it is and that's the problem unless you keep a food journal it's really hard to know and and a reaction that extreme my friend's nose was just a little runny mm -hmm. a reaction that's extreme can be quite uncomfortable if not life-threatening so it's important to know that yeah and to keep a journal of what you can and can't have and then also the thing that comes into my mind about when I was on the biggest part of the elimination diet, how many of my friends sort of egg you on to cheat a little bit? It's like, oh, it's, you know, so-and-so's birthday. We're out here celebrating or whatever. So please, if it's your friends, just, you know, honor that they don't want to eat it and move on. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I used to be okay eating prawns and then I cooked prawns one evening 
Within half an hour, my skin was itching so much. I could hardly stop scratching. I had to run up to the bathroom where I knew I'd got some antihistamine and take an antihistamine tablet. I was clawing at my scalp, it was so itchy. And now my husband says to me, well, I'm sure you could eat some prawns if you wanted to. I, Do you know what? Not interested. It's like <laughs> aversion <immediate>. therapy. <laughs> it is. That's exactly it. It's immediate in, in, aversion therapy. And sometimes I use that as an example to my clients because they go, oh, yeah, I really don't want to eat whatever, but I really love it. And I say to them, you know, I used to love eating prawns. And then I tell them the story and I say, do you think I'll eat a prawn now? And they go, well, you might. I go, no, <laughs> no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to go through that. So, yeah, just immediate uh, aversion therapy. And the meat just points out so many things that uh, us with autoimmune might start to freak out. Oh, my gosh, is this a flare? Is this another autoimmune condition? Is it, you know, and not that it's simple to get an allergic reaction of that intensity, but maybe it's something else and that's the critical point that i want to make here is it's not everything is about autoimmune yeah. or and the other thing i find i was on a zoom call with a gallery there was i don't know how many people on but i think i saw like nine people in my little gallery there somebody coughed without muting and this is zoom and half the people went i'm like <laughs> You're not so how hyper reactive we all are right now. It just seems weird now watching TV shows where people are hugging each other. You kind of think, oh, don't do that. I I know. I'm like, oh, this is an old show. Yeah. <laughs> and then I see the new shows where they've got masks on. I'm like, you know, 20 years from now, we're going to go. Wow, that was a 20. That's a 20 year old show. <laughs> <laughs> Almost sort of like people with old cell phones. You know, you're like, oh, yeah. this is an old show. <laughs> mask or no mask anyway we need to take a quick commercial break when we come back we're going to talk to pat a little bit more about uh, ideas for us to just to calm those anxieties <laughs> whether it's autoimmune anxieties is this autoimmune or not or pandemic or not we'll be right back your conscious lifestyle on steroids ohm times radio iom fm change and growth are part of natural life and also part of your spiritual life. Everyone needs support and guidance, especially during life passages. Upgrade yourself with the Ohm Times Experts program. With Ohm Times Experts, you have access to the best intuitive coaches, spiritual teachers, counselors, astrologists, and oracles. Our team was carefully selected so you can trust. Find out more at experts.ohmtimes.com. Grab a cup of tea or a glass of wine and tune in for Inspired Conversations with publisher Linda Joy on Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern. Linda creates sacred space for leading female luminaries, empowering authors, heart-centered female entrepreneurs, coaches, and healers. A soulful venue where guests openly share the fears and obstacles they've overcome, wisdom and lessons learned, and the personal journey that led them to the transformational work they do in the world. Inspired conversations to empower you on your path to authentic, soulful living. Research shows we apologize up to 10 times a day, and most of the time, we say sorry as a response to someone else's mistake. What if we thanked people instead of all that unnecessary apologizing? So instead of saying, sorry, I'm rambling, you say, thank you for listening. Join us at projectforgive.com, a free non-religious resource on global forgiveness. Welcome back, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour. I'm Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com. And tonight we're here with the international star. I just love her, Pat Duckworth. She's the author of... Hot Women, Cool Solutions. I got to remember that name. I love the name of the book, by the way. She's a best-selling author, an international public speaker and therapist, and she specializes in helping women in midlife, particularly experiencing menopause. And so often it gets confused with men uh, menopause and autoimmune get confused. And now, I want to, just with the anxiety of the pandemic and everything, one of the things I know we talked about 
mindfulness and we talked about meditation and being able just to step outside and breathe and separate ourselves from whatever's causing that reaction to us. And yet I find that during the day, my mind still can run away with me. (laughs) I mean, I might just be getting a little allergic reaction. We're having a lot of leaves falling here right now. And there's a lot of dust in the air. And gosh, just went through the smoke and the fires of the wildfires where I live. I just find it begins to compile on itself. And now I'm a little bit anxious myself and begin to wonder about with the holidays coming. So let's delve into a few more tips that you might have for people just to be able to um, sort it all out. Yeah, so there's a really quick technique uh, that I think is really useful. I've adapted it from somebody else's technique, added a couple of steps in, and I call it the radical technique. And it's uh, so it's an acronym. So the first part is to recognize when you're having an anxious thought. It's just a thought. It's not a thing. It's a thought. And your brain is generating thoughts all the time. You're not in control of the thoughts your brain is generating. What you're in control of is whether you spend time thinking them. That might sound weird, but there's a difference between your brain going, what do you think about this? And you either leaping on it or going, I don't want to think about that. So this is a way not to think about it. So the R is to notice, recognize when you're having a thought that might be a bit worrying, uh, a little bit anxious. It's just a thought. You've recognized it. The A is to acknowledge it, not beating yourself up, not going here. I go again. I'm always doing this. No, we're not doing that. You've recognized you've had a thought, acknowledge it. Even like pat yourself on the back that you actually noticed it before it got a grip on you, before you went down the the roadway of actually spending time with that thought. You want to let that thought go. So recognize it, acknowledge it. The D is to do something about it. Now, this is the fun part because, you know, if you go into an anxious thought, your body responds, it starts to like contract because, well, you know all this with your body language, but you know, the body responds to feeling anxious. So to reverse it, you do something. You can have a little dance if you're in the place where you can dance, you know, middle of the (laughs) office, you might not want to do it, Um, but you could have a little dance. You could, if you're by yourself, sing a happy song. You could just change your posture. You could sit up straighter, put your hands on your hips, stand with your feet apart, you know, go into that super uh, superhero. I was going to say supermodel, could be supermodel. Go to superhero (laughs) pose. power pose, it helps you breathe. People go, I always do that pose. But actually, when you think about it, it just widens your lung capacity. (laughs) And releases testosterone into your system so you feel less anxious. So dance, sing, superhero Even just if you're in the office, putting a pen between your lips sideways lifts your cheeks up. Your brain thinks, oh, my goodness, this isn't where we were going. She seems to be smiling. I thought we were going to a bad place. It's funny that you mentioned that. I was I had never thought of that. (laughs) I don't know which is weirder because I was going to mention a forced laugh, a forced giggle just for a moment, even if you're sitting at your desk in the office and you're (laughs) It does the same thing. I'm not sure which is weirder, whether I do a forced laugh or I do this. I don't think, I think in the (laughs) office, nobody would notice you doing that, but you can take it to the next level. So you put it between your teeth and then you roll, you put your chin up because when you think about it, if you're getting a bit down, the head drops. So you lift your chin up, you roll your eyes upwards and move them from side to side. I'm going to show you the whole amazing effect here. <laughs> All of the things to your brain is this is crazy, it's okay, and your brain starts to shift gears. It was going into this lower gear and now it's starting to shift up. So, dance, sing, power, pen, lots of things you can do. Physically, change something for two, three minutes so that your brain gets a different signal. And then the I is identify a new thought. What would be a more positive thought in this situation? 
and then from there start to make that thought bigger amplify the thought so notice the thought make it bigger make this new thought bigger and the l of radical is a bit i like which is the laugh because i think it's richard bandler who uh, developed nlp said when you're over this problem you're going to laugh so why don't you laugh now so just get to the end of all of that even a false laugh will change the chemistry of your brain so just <laughs> again if you've got people around you you may want to go to the bathroom before you do that or pretend you're talking to somebody on the phone and go <laughs> exactly that was what i was going to say bring up a good meme and oh that's a good one <laughs> <laughs> so that whole radical technique takes three four minutes to do and just shifts the thoughts just shift them don't let your brain start to go down that pathway if it's not helpful how was that oh, oh i love it i love it and for those on the audio let's talk about the pin just i want to reflect because it the visual the, the video is great so you put the pin in your mouth you lift your chin up so you're looking at the sky and then you shift your eyes from left to right very rapid and do it you guys you're gonna see what we were laughing about as far as the visual and i just did it for a moment there as i described it and it does shift you very quickly that i probably did what three or four times left and right with my eyes not nothing major there i wasn't doing it for a long period of time seconds yeah yeah you're, it, it, it's just it's to do with your neurology this is the way the brain works if the eyes are going up then uh, you're into the visual part of your brain and you're switching your eyes backwards and forwards and now it just gets confused and it stops doing the thing it was doing really rapid to do it. Hmm. Well, I remember from my NLP days that the confused mind always says no. So maybe when I'm anxiety and I'm doing that, the confused mind is like, yeah, we don't have time to be anxious. We're trying yeah. to figure out what's going on here. No. <laughs> One of the other things I say to my clients and you know, I might have to change it for the American market is that, you know, your awareness and your thoughts are two different things. So you become aware of your thoughts, but your brain is manufacturing the thoughts. And it's like a TV going in the corner all the time. You know, it's just like continuous stream, but you're not in control of them. So I say it's like you're standing at a bus stop. Do you have bus stops? Yeah, we have bus stops. Okay. <laughs> I'll take so you to one next time you're in town. <laughs> <laughs> I have stood at a bus stop in America, actually. It wasn't a great experience. but No, I'm, I didn't say it was great. You said, do we have them? <laughs> <laughs> it was in downtown Los Angeles. It wasn't a place to be. Anyway, so you're standing at a bus stop. You're waiting to go somewhere. You know the, the direction you want to go. You know the destination. You're not in control of the buses that are turning up. The bus controller back at the bus station is sending buses out. So these are like your thoughts. They're just being sent out. And as you stand there as your awareness standing at the bus stop, if the bus isn't going to the destination you want to go to, don't get on it. Let it go <laughs> by. Go, okay, thank you. No, not this one. And then the next one comes along. No, thank you. And then the next one's going to your destination. Get on it. I love that. That's great. I love the bus stop analogy. And what, what I talk about is sunglasses. How time I walked into the store with sunglasses on and, and they're the polarizing kind of, oh, the vibrant colors and all of this. I didn't realize the sunglasses were changing the, my viewpoint oh. <laughs> of it. So I always talk about this metaphor of like, make sure, you know, what glasses are you wearing as you make these choices and understand take off your sunglasses and see if the colors are still so vibrant <laughs> so great oh my gosh pat we're down to the last seven minutes i want people to be able to know more about your book and any final thoughts you want to share plus where they can find out more about you and just all this great stuff so have at it <sighs> So Hot Women Cool Solutions was the first book I wrote. And that really is, it was going to be just the mind body book because there's so many techniques that I can teach. But in the end, I gave all the resources, you know, all the different things like, you know, the food side of it and the herbal side and some of the other complementary techniques that you can use, you know, like reflexology and acupuncture. So I look at that as really my upskilling book if you want to know about menopause that will tell you 
just about everything you need to know. I talk about HRT, you know, if that's what the route you want to go down, or even bioidentical. So that's that book. And uh, there's also cool recipes for hot women, because I just know that the nutrition side of this is, is so important. Um, there's a hotwomencoolsolutions.com website, which has some free gifts on it. And uh, so there are some meditations, some visualizations that you can use. And I'm just writing, I've just finished writing actually Mind the Menopause Gap, which is about what happens to us in the workplace, because there are more women over 50 in the workplace than ever before and experiencing menopause symptoms can really impact on your performance at work. Here in the UK, this is a big subject. Employers are now putting menopause policies in place, but you can get in front of this particular wave in, in the US by thinking about your own workplace and what support you could get in order to deal with your menopause symptoms. Because if you're not performing at your best, if you're feeling less than confident, um, there are some simple changes you can make in the workplace that would help you. So really think about the whole picture of it, how it's affecting your home life, but maybe how it's affecting your career and your personal life as well. Get lots of good sleep, because that's important to you in the workplace. Oh, absolutely. Sleeping in the workplace. <laughs> <laughs> yes we, we separate those get lots of good sleep so you're confident and able to <laughs> confident to work in the workplace absolutely and I think that's overlooked I'm I'm excited to see that people are taking that mantle up and being able to talk about it and not just from this idea of menopause only but life challenges health challenges and how they affect our workplace so many times whether it's autoimmune menopause or other things People gut it out. It's like, oh, I'm just going to bootstrap this and get through it. Do you have a couple of tips that you can share in our last couple of minutes here that to help us talk about it in the workplace without being shy or embarrassed or feeling guilty about it? Well, in some ways, it starts with the employers creating that atmosphere where it's okay to talk about it because you know, we talk about it being women in their late 40s, early 50s. But of course, if you have a hysterectomy, that could happen at any time. Cancer treatment could happen at any time. And even in the workplace now, people who are transgender, and if you're a trans man, and uh, you're having to take hormones to make that transition, that could happen at any time as well. And whether you can talk about this is really down to what sort of environment your employer creates. But there's some simple things that you need in the workplace. It might be, you know, access to cold water, access to bathrooms, um, somewhere where you can keep uh, sanitary products or even medication, somewhere secure where you can keep those things or private where you can keep them. You might even, if you wear a uniform at work, need to get some concessions around your uniform uh, as I've mentioned to you, I've worked a lot with fire officers and the women fire officers. They need changes of uniform in, in case they got over hot because they're in hot situations. And they even have special packs that they keep in the uh, fire equipment, in the fire engines. They have sanitary packs in there because the women may be away from the fire station for a long while. There's just lots of practical things that you can do. You might have to upskill your manager. So when my book comes out, I'll tell you, Sharon, because it could be something that you need to have in the workplace to upskill your manager in being able to talk about it. Oh, wow. Those are things I hadn't even considered. Absolutely. So excited for your new book, Pat. This is awesome. Thank you for joining us and talking about this subject that some people are afraid to talk about. They're embarrassed to talk about it. And I just love that you bring a common sense cool voice to it about this is natural it's part of aging if you're female you go through it if you love a female you learn to deal with it <laughs> yeah this is about the guys as well you know that they're they're impacted if we're not sleeping well if we're not happy they get impacted too Oh, absolutely. But that's for another time, I think. We'll talk about that as a relationship, too. I mean, it's not true with autoimmune. If you're not sleeping well from autoimmune or anything else, 
it impacts the whole family. So thank you for sharing so many tips. I love the radical solution there that you shared with us. Everyone, that's Pat Duckworth. Her book is Hot Women, Cool Solutions, as well she's got new books coming out, as, and her cookbook is awesome. And she's a best-selling author, therapist, and international public speaker, and it's patduckworth.com. Any other websites or other places that you'd like to share? Um, you can find me all over social media on LinkedIn or on Facebook and um, yes, yeah, smarter men um, hot women cool solutions.com has all the freebies on it. Awesome. Everyone that's Pat Duckworth. Join me next week for another brand new episode. Have a great week, whatever your adventures, stay safe, stay sane. <laughs> and that's what I'm saying these days. <laughs> and we'll be talking soon. Enjoy. The information provided on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune and Life Interrupted Radio, including the websites understandingautoimmune.com and lifeinterruptedradio.com, plus social media, is for educational purposes only. What you read, hear, and see on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune and Life Interrupted Radio, and its websites and other media outlets is based on experience only. The information should never be used for any legal, diagnostic, or treatment purposes. Always seek sound legal, medical, and or professional advice regarding any problems, conditions, and any of the recommendations you see, hear, or read here on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio. 